Hey guys, welcome to The Wooden Dummy. So is, I know this has been a long awaited time for all of you and uh, yeah, now is the time to try to put everything that we've learned into application on the dummy. So um, one thing to note is that for this program I've made it so there is eight sections. So I've, I've, I've sort of categorized the dummy form into eight different sections, okay. In Choshantin's book they categorize it in 10 different sections, okay. I don't know the reason for why sometimes when you do the same um, sequence on both sides, so a lot of sequences just like the other forms, we do it on the left first and then we do it on the right or we do it on the right and then we do it on the left. Sometimes in a book uh, when, when a, a section is done on the left and right, they count that as one uh, section one part of the section and sometimes they count it as two separate parts. That's why it's, um, it ends up being 10 sections. But for me I thought it's going to be easier in terms of explanation and in terms of referring to different sections on the online school when you guys have questions. It's easier to just um, make it eight sections. So if something is done on the left and right, we count that as one section, okay, rather than separating into two sections. Um, you'll know what I mean once you start watching the video. So that's the first point. Of course I haven't changed anything in the form, the sequences are exactly the same, the movements are exactly the same, but just the sections um, I thought will be easier for you guys to refer to um, when you're asking questions. Now the wooden dummy, the wooden dummy is actually the, a, a perfect training partner, it really is, um, because you can really take your time and go at your own speed, go at your own pace and really be able to um, apply all these tools that you guys have now learned from the different forms, all these feelings that you have. You can start to really uh, do it on your own terms. You know with a training partner obviously you know uh, their force changes and you know you can't ask someone to stand here for half an hour while you slowly put it on and slowly you know do things because they'll get bored and, and you want to you know usually when it's when you when you uh, do it on them after a while it's their turn to do it you know whereas the wooden dummy it's always your turn and it's always going to be here so you can go as, as slow as you want you can go as hard as you want you can hit it as hard as you want um, later on so it's a, it's, it really is a really really good training partner and the fact that it's got some movement you know the arms the leg, the, the, the body, it has some movement. It's really good because um, uh, later on as you do the program, as you, you watch the videos, you understand the reason for it. But it's really good to be able to transfer that little minute movements we get. It helps to be able to identify when you've successfully transferred your mass to the dummy. Okay, um, so yeah, it's a very good uh, training tool and usually people get addicted to it when they start practicing. So the main uh, principle of the wooden dummy form is to be able to combine the essential aspects of all the three empty hand forms, so Silum Tao, Chum Q, Bilgi, to be able to combine what we've learned from those three forms and to be able to use them to attack the dummy. So uh, when I say attack the dummy, the dummy form is really uh, a fighting a practice for, for real fighting. Okay, when we say in Silum Tao Tam Q, especially in those two forms, um, I will always say don't think about fighting, don't think about the application of, of uh, applications of the movements, they're just to cultivate particular ideas and, and be able to tap into your mass, etc. Um, in Bill G, we start to speed up and, 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 uh, and work on getting maximum power, so it's related to fighting and the movements are a lot more uh, useful for, for uh, fighting applications. But in the wooden dummy it's definitely 100% fighting. So we actually uh, think about the dummy being an opponent and that every movement of the dummy is an, is an offensive movement, it's an attack. Okay. Uh, now of course there's a, a, there is a sequence because there's a form and the dummy is not live. So there is a sequence. So you know after one move we do another move and after that move we do another move. So it's, it, we're presuming that after we do something to the opponent they're going to react in a particular way and, and therefore uh, it, it makes sense to follow up you know, with the next movement in the, in the form. But of course this is just a presumption. So in, in a realistic situation of course you can't guess 
what the person is going to be doing. And, and this is something that um, naturally through sparring, later on through chisa, you'll get to sense what the person's going to do next. You get to feel what they're going to do next and you respond accordingly, okay? So of course, this is just a sequence thing and it's not in a fight. Every time you do this, you're going to follow up with something like this, okay? This is quite uh, self-explanatory. So the aim is to, in every movement, be able to transfer our mass to the dummy. So in every single movement, we're able to put our mass to the dummy and every movement should have the multi-directional force that we've been cultivating, especially through Chum Q. Um, now, this is something that um, is not easy to do at first, but and this is the reason why I left it until now. Um, you know, the way Tosh and Tin uh, learnt it is he did Silum Tao Chum Q, and then after Chum Q he learnt the dummy. So I was thinking, should I put the dummy before Bilji or after? And I decided to put it after Bilji because um, that's the way he taught it. So he taught the three empty hands form first, and then the dummies. That's the, I just want to follow his way of teaching. But also, there's a lot of um, movements that are from Bilji that, that's in the dummy. So if you just go straight from Chum Q to the wooden dummy, there's a lot of movement like the Gaan Sao's, like, like, like these movements that, are, that, that might seem a bit foreign to you because you haven't done it um, in the Chum Q form and because it's in a Bill G form. Um, but also mainly, so as I said, you're trying to deliver your entire mass and have multi-directional forces, which is from Silum Tao and Chum Q. But also the dummy is where we can start to apply that vortex force of Bill G. Okay, so that's why I wanted you guys to practice um, build the building form first to at least um, be able to fathom the concept of that vortex force, and then in the dummy we, we able to um, we able to use it because it's, in T cell it's not really easy to use that force because it's too dynamic to, to, to learn how to apply that force because it's too dynamic at first. Of course, later once you learn how to use that vortex force on the dummy then you have to practice it in a more dynamic sense. But also for the ones that can uh, later on use that kind of Bilgi force, usually we would say, or Choice continues to say, it's not recommended. He wouldn't recommend that we use the Bilgi force uh, within TSA because you could really hurt the person. Okay, so this is a very good tool to be able to apply that really fast, sharp vortex force into it. Now, um, you know, right now I've been talking about it is it is a, a, a form that's for fighting um, and that you want to produce all your mass to it, things like that. And this may, you know, um, make the student want to start hitting the dummy very hard to start off with. Okay, so this happens at our school here as well where the senior students that, you know, work their way up to the dummy, as soon as they start, and it's, you know, it's something that's, that makes sound, you know, and it's, uh, it's wooden and people are usually conditioned and they want to corner their body so they, you know, they start wanting to make sound, they want to make loud sound. This is very, very, very common, not just in this, this in an inch, but anyone, you know, you've got an object in front of you, just like a punching bag, you put a punching bag in front of someone and what they want to do is just hit it hard, make it move more. So it's a natural sort of human uh, response to have, a martial artist response to having a target in front of you and you smashing it. But I highly recommend not to go for that, not to go, not to aim to get a loud sound, okay? Because when we aim to get a loud sound, what we start doing is what I'm doing here, is doing, uh, you know, leading with our forearm and it becomes all forearm sort of oriented movements. And once you get into that habit, it's going to be very, very difficult to break that habit. Trust me, I know, because I was doing exactly that. When I first learned the wooden dummy, uh, I learned it from Mark Spence about four years before I moved to Hong Kong, three years before I moved to Hong Kong. I used to have my dummy in the back shed of my house, and I used to go there, and I used to just work on it for an hour. Boom, 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 you know, come out sweating. It was a tin shed, so in the summer it was hot anyway, but I'll come out sweating, Muscles pumped, you know, and, and almost like I'd had a workout. So when I came to Hong Kong, both with Chi Sao and the wooden dummy practice, um, I had to put them aside because when I was doing it, Seagull was like, yeah, you, you're completely using your forearm. You, I, you haven't got the idea right. So I actually had to stop doing Chi Sao and, and the wooden dummy for, for years until I learned how to, what he was talking about regarding Silentai Champion, etc. And then slowly, slowly, I 
develop, cultivate their new habits, the right, the correct ways of um, striking the dummy, applying multidirectional force, etc. So um, I, I highly advise that you do not clash with the dummy. Don't go for forearm clashing movements, okay? Um, don't go for loud sounds. Now, as we know, the theory of Wing Chun is to confront the opponent face on. You know, we have the facing, uh, fa you know, the, the, the article that Siegel wrote, facing one's shadow, chasing one's shadow, and pointing to the center line. So, meaning that regardless of where the opponent is, we always want to be facing them. We, we don't want to sort of stand side onto the opponent. If you're the opponent, we always want to be facing, right? That's the Wing Chun theory. So, in the, in the wooden dummy, it's the same as well, in that my right arm is, is, is wanting to be uh, contacting and, and playing with the dummy's left arm, you know, so the mirroring arm, what I call, you know, and this arm with this arm. However, there, is, uh, there are some movements where, um, uh, let's say the bong sao, there's, there's, there's a few times, there's a few bong sao's within the dummy where the right arm is, is, where is uh, touching the cross arm, not the mirroring arm, touching the cross arm, okay? So doing something like this. Now, in Cantonese, it, it, we, we call that the uh, wrong bong sao. So it trans translates to wrong bong sao, incorrect bong sao, inappropriate bong sao, okay? And that is, that's just to suggest that it is not advised for us to be, if this was a real, real person and he's, he's throwing, you know, a punch with this arm, it's not advised to do this for the obvious reason that now I can't hit there and I've actually blindsided myself. So I've turned side on to the dummy, to the, to the opponent. He can hit me with this one, you know, with, with the leg, with here, whereas I can't do much. So we don't want to be in this position. That's why it's called the wrong bong sa. And, and there aren't too many of them in the dummy. Um, and that is to suggest that it's not a, uh, it's not a advisable thing to do. But the reason it's in there is, uh, so that if you do end up in there momentarily, you'll know what to do to follow up. You'll know if you're in a bad position, unfavorable position, uh, the, dummy, the dummy's practice gives us tools that in a fight, if you're in that position, how to be able to quickly regain their more advantageous position, okay? So this kind of stuff I'll go deeper into, um, you know, as the program progresses. Um, now, also the techniques of the dummy is always working on um, simultaneous usage of both arms, okay? So, you know, generally speaking, there are some movements where it's just one arm, but, but generally speaking, it teaches us how to use both arms um, in unity. So both arms powered by the center so that both arms are working together. When the body's moving, the, the, body, the body's movement is powering both arms. And if each arm is... You know, if, if, if we're doing things correctly, we're utilizing the joints correctly, doing all the things that you guys have been working on within the forms and in the, you know, partner exercises, if we're using the body and the joints correctly, we are producing multidirectional force with, which, uh, with each arm, okay? Now, so if we've got, we've got multidirectional force with this arm and with this arm, and, and both arms are working together you know, in unity, then something like that done on a human, it, it, the force that it creates um, is very different to a normal force that, it, you know, the same movement, if I'm just pressing here, pulling here and moving the body, this, even though the sound, the look on the dummy might look the same from outside, this is very different to this. And, and later on, of course, um, f further on in the dummy section in this program, we're going to be looking at the application of the movements and the power generation of the movements. And when you start to do that on a human, you'll start to realize that uh, people that are making a lot of sound, you know, people that are doing that, when they do it on a human, when you put your arm on and say, okay, do that movement on me, they'll realize that it's a waste of time and it's useless to make sound like that. And the ones that have been doing it right, working on producing multidirectional force with each arm, They'll be able to, what it does is it puts you in a state, it gives you a feeling of, it's quite remarkable, gives you a feeling of, like you start to feel your power. So when I'm doing it, I start to feel that I'm producing multidirectional force and I start to feel it's a play of force. I'm playing with energy, I'm playing with force and, I'm, and I'm, later on this leads up to being able to use my intention to affect the dummy in, in different ways. Uh, or, you know, and again, it's hard to see it from outside 
and it looks the same no matter if I do it wrong or right it looks the same makes the same sound but m me myself I will feel what I'm doing so I'll know if, if there's a human in front of me I'll be able to affect their body in such in such a way you know in, in a particular kind of way and this is very unique to to this energy of Wing Chun where in T Sao or whatever we the aim is to connect with them and to be able to control them not just to push them back and pull them forward be able to really send the force to different parts of their bodies to get um, different kinds of effects okay so um, and what it does in, within that state when you're in that state, you know, and when you're touching the dummy sort of in that way where I've got multi-directional forces here, it, it makes me become extremely sensitive to um, the dummy, to, to what I'm touching, be it the dummy or the opponent. So that sensitivity is very different to um, muscle memory, okay? It's very different to muscle memory. It's a, it's a, it's a very spontaneous feeling, uh, feeling thing like I always liken it to a surfer on the surfboard right they don't think about what to do they're very sensitive to the very present and according to what happens they react accordingly doing putting on that state and connecting with the dummy in that way and, and being able to produce that kind of force gives you that same ability gives you that kind of spontaneous uh, sensitivity we don't want to develop muscle memory in this in this art it's different to you know doing it we still drill and things like that but it's different to do sort of uh, doing if someone does this I'll do that and you do that 10,000 times and that just becomes muscle memory nothing wrong with that but it's very different what we do we don't want to do muscle memory if you uh, if you are just sort of working with muscle memory where after this you know I'll do that and after that I'll do this and then it becomes muscle memory even in chi it becomes muscle memory to go up and down up and down and do the traps then um, it's very hard to get out of that habit once that habit is built you know I always say muscle memory always always overrides your own intention hence why it's so important to relax first so we can get rid of the muscle memory or we can reset the muscle memory and have it so that they don't get involved so that we can produce this kind of power now the stance is an, a very important part of the the whole system but it's particularly in, in the wooden dummy because by having the correct stance um, we are able to like i said be able to deliver our our entire mass into the arms or into the limbs because we also have kicks in the dummy so um it's it's the stance is, is crucial and and that's one thing to be able to del deliver our mass because you know as you know if the stance is on the way i'm saying i'm not saying stance in terms of being able to push from the ground obviously having the correct stance gives us the right kind of uh base to be able to sing to be able to tap into our mass and to be able to deliver our mass through the uh, united coordinated movement of the whole body um, but also it enables us to position ourselves so when we move around the dummy we move around a semicircle but also utilizing the stance in, in such ways um, in, in the correct ways enables us to be able to um, position ourselves in such a way so we are always um, having maximum effect on the dummy we are always uh, hitting the weakest point of the dummy again this will make sense later on um, as we go on through the program, but it is that it is using our most powerful, using our maximum power to be able to affect the dummy in the best way by attacking its weakest point at the weakest angle. Okay, and that's got to do with the stance. That's that's extremely important with the stance. Okay, um, so yeah, there's a lot of other stuff with the dummy, and as as I said, as we go through the program, uh, you'll find more and more gems with the practice of this bad boy, um, but for the ones as i said it's a great tool especially now right now we're filming this in the beginning of the or one year into the COVID uh period and obviously not being able to uh have a partner you know at times like that or when you if uh, if naturally you don't have access to a partner you don't have many partners around you training partners you can uh, work on the dummy and you can get a lot out of the application of the three forms however you still need chi sao if you really want to uh, you know get the master wing chun let's say you still need chi sao this is this you can get some things from the dummy that you can't get from chi sao uh, like how to navigate around position the body stuff like that and take your time with each movement apply different ways uh, apply different things in different ways but also you can get 
things from Chisa that you can't get from the dummy for the obvious reason that the Chisa, the, the partner is live. So it gives you when, you, when you give it force, this one just moves. Whereas in Chisa, the person reacts. They give force back in particular ways. They, they move, all of that. So t you, this cannot replace Chisa. You still must do Chisa if, if you are interested in that fighting aspect. And, and gen generally in being able to master the art, get the highest level, Chisa is a huge part of Wing Chun. So you, you cannot replace... Um, you cannot replace chi sao with the dummy. And finally, as I said at the start of this video, uh, the dummy is just to, a tool to be able to apply what we've learned from the first three empty, empty hand forms, Silum Tai Chum Kyu Bilji, to be able to attack an opponent. Okay? So the more you can go deeper, the better you are in, in, in those forms. In, especially Silum Tao because of state but once you have the state the better you can move within that state to be able to de deliver mass and then in Bill G to, to be able to get that vortex force and get force to your fingertips the better you are at those naturally the better you're going to be at the dummy okay so we get sometimes people that rush their way to the wooden dummy form which is what I did back in Australia you, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know when you do Wing Chun I know I did I know the people here they did you really want to get to the dummy because it's an iconic thing, right? It's an iconic part of Wing Chun, the Wing Chun system. So uh, some people tend to rush to get to the dummy form. Um, and even for you guys, you know, third year in the program, for some of you, because you, you're not training daily, you're not, you're not training long periods every day, three years might still be too early to play on the dummy, to, you know, to go to delve deep into the dummy. You can still use it for just single movements, but to delve, delve deep into the... Um, the movements of the form three years might still be too early okay so you've got to gauge yourself but the people that like for, from experience here and from the experience of teaching for 19 years I've witnessed that people that rush to go to the dummy what they do well, like what happened with me they get bad habits and then either they never lose those habits and those bad habits come into their chi sao come into their sparring as well so it's actually detrimental to their training the only benefit they get is to be able to move a bit faster and condition their forearm um, whereas people that take their time, just in general, not just with the dummy, but the, with every form, they really solidify the foundation before moving to the next thing. Um, they pick up things much faster, you know. Um, I've had students where, uh, like Michael, Michael Zen, which is a teacher here, he, when, when he started uh, learning the dummy, the way that he can apply elbow force to the dummy and move his body as one unit, um, you know, it, it, it within one or two months is better than some other senior students that we have here that have been doing the dummy for a year, where they, they're still clashing, they still don't have elbow force, and they can't coordinate their body upright, moving at the same time. Why? Because Michael really spent a lot of time on, of course, he had, you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, private training with myself and all the teachers here, so, you know, he, he and he trained more, and he sort of um, submerged himself more in, in the art but it's because he really took his time he didn't rush it is it when he was waiting whenever we say okay now you're ready to do this then he will do it you know so uh, he did it in that way and as a result he saved a lot of time and he saved a lot of time in, in not not getting bad habits so he saved a lot of time and energy okay so in conclusion the message is really hammer down and work hard and try to understand uh, the core principles and the essential aspects of each form, the empty hand forms first, take your time with them and then move to the dummy and apply today. Okay? Have fun and enjoy your training.